get out your notebook and I would like you to just copy down this acronym. CAP. In this class, for a variety of reasons, we look at a lot of historical documents. Okay, there's there's two broad types of documents. You've got your primary source documents, which are like a piece of history. They're from a historical time period. It's, uh, you know, it's actually Confucius writing some stuff down, okay? It's from that time period, it's a piece of history. We also see a lot of secondary sources, like your textbook is a secondary source, but also just, you know, history books written by historians, articles on the internet, those can be source documents as well. The reason it's so important to get used to reading these sort of historical documents is a lot of what we do assessment wise uh, from our multiple choice tests, like the one we're going to have on Monday, uh, our document based essays, um, some of our SAQs will have documents attached. Uh, in fact, one of the, the daily assignments I'm going to start giving you guys a lot is just reading through documents, answering some questions. Um, this is something that historians kind of use to vet documents to kind of see how accurate they are. Uh, honestly, this is more helpful for your SAQs, your DBQs, and your document assignments. But I figured since I'm introducing documents just to kind of get you used to the process of reading through them, we'd go ahead and go over the CAP process. So today, uh, we're going to start off with an explanation of CAP. You're going to use it a little bit today. You'll really be using it a lot when we start doing DBQ essays. Uh, but still, it's something just to kind of think about when you're reading a document. Once that's done, we are going to do a practice document analysis activity. Okay, it is on Canvas. I'll show you where it is here in a minute. Uh, this in and of itself, it's not like an assignment grade that you're going to submit. But what we're going to do when we practice it, there's some questions you're going to answer. You're going to number off in your notebook and answer in your notebook. And I'm going to make that a part of your next notebook check. So it is kind of for a grade. It contributes for your notebook check. Uh, but it's not going to be like a daily grade. So, uh, once that's done, we're essentially done for the day. It's going to be a pretty laid back, pretty easy day, but you're going to need to be willing to talk. you got to participate. Uh, us talking through this is going to make everything a lot easier. Okay, so I'm going to give you a few minutes to just kind of copy down your, your acronym there. Um, just a little hint, when you're doing anything in your notebook, always start off with the day's date. It makes it a lot easier for you if you're trying to find something. And it makes it easier for me while I'm checking the books. So I'll give you a minute or two to finish that and then we'll get started. Uh, again, it's all about just acquainting you with with all things document analysis today. Make sure we don't have anybody else who's tried to join. Again, you don't necessarily need the stuff on the side for now. Also, and it's the same document that I've got hanging up here as a poster. Don't worry about those two O's at the end. That's something we'll get into later when we really do get into DBQ essays specifically. All right, looks like most of you guys are done or getting done. So just kind of listen up. Uh, again, our learning goal today, let's just go over it because that helps put us all in the right direction. I guess I could actually stay in. Evaluate the impact of historical context, intended audience, purpose, and point of view in primary and secondary source documents by participating in independent practice and then some collaborative group discussion. Again, we'll go through how all of these things may kind of impact what's being said in the document. And, and, you know, we're looking for things like bias and factors. Historians have to do that all the time. Just because it was written down a long time ago doesn't mean it's entirely true. People have agendas. So we'll look at that. Then we'll do the practice. You'll answer some questions on your own. You'll read some documents. I'll give you a time limit. 
and we'll come back and discuss it. And hopefully, uh, not only will that familiarize you with this process, but also some of these documents you're actually going to see on the test on Monday. So I'm kind of giving away some things you may want to look into. Uh, other announcements, uh, again, if you haven't done that introductory discussion board, please get it done. It's too darn easy not to. Uh, as far as grades, notebook grades should be in now. If you turn them in on time, if they're late, I may not have gotten to it yet, uh, but check your grades. Uh, I will tell you, especially on the notebook grade, remember it averages into your final test grade. So if you get a zero on that notebook check, that first one or the second one, not only is that a zero for a daily grade, but that means when I average them together, like say you didn't turn in the first notebook check, if you turn in the second one, even if you had 100, the best you could possibly get on the overall test grade notebook is a 50. Okay, you don't want to do that. Not turning in notebooks makes it very difficult to pass for the 60s. So just going to keep that in mind. Uh, but those grades are in. I'm working on the essays currently. I'm um, anticipating by the end of the weekend having those grades all cut up. Those discussion boards won't take long. So hopefully by Monday, your grade will be very reflective of what it actually is in this class. Uh, speaking of Monday, we do have that test, 20 questions, multiple choice. Uh, we're going to do that in class together. Uh, it's going to be online. And finally, the grace period. Uh, I'd said I'm trying to be very lenient right now. Just, just understanding the, the weirdness of the world that we're all going through. Uh, but please, you know, get all your missing stuff in by the end of the weekend because uh, starting next week, we are adhering to those due dates. Just keep that in mind. Yes, sip of my Dr. Pepper and we'll talk. Can everybody see this okay? Like, I don't need to turn off the lights or anything for this. Okay. So, document analysis. Like I said, we look at a lot of documents in this class. When we eventually get to the DBQ essay, which is essentially what the DBQ essay is, it's structured very similar to the essay you already wrote, the, the regular long essay. The only difference is you'll have a writing prompt and then you're going to have seven documents that you're going to use to kind of prove your arguments correct. Uh, once you get it down, I honestly think it's the easier of the two essays, but it's kind of complicated. OK, in addition to, you know, writing this big essay, you've got to read all these documents and you got to figure out what they're trying to say. And then you got to look for common themes that connect to, to whatever your writing prompt is. And that, that's just a process. It takes a while. So we're going to look at a whole lot of documents and practice doing stuff like we are today before we ever get to that essay. OK, this is these are baby steps, uh, but this is kind of why we do this stuff. Uh, like I said, you're going to see documents on the DBQ essay. Every once in a while, your essay cues, those short answer questions will be tied to a document. On your multiple choice tests, all of your questions typically, this, this first one, maybe not all of them, but typically all of your questions are centered on some document. So you need to get just, just in practice of reading some really old stuff because, you know, a thousand years ago, even a hundred years ago, people talk quite a bit different than they do today. Uh, but also, you need to familiarize yourself with this cap process because, like I said, just because it's written down, just because it's from 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago, doesn't mean it's necessarily true. I mean, if I wrote something and somebody here in 100 years found it, man, how would they know it was true? Historians got to look for evidence. They've got to corroborate. They've got to try to prove these things. But there's also some really basic things they can look at to try to look at the authenticity of the document and try to see what sort of outside factors may have affected what's being said. That's where the cap process comes in. So let me explain what cap is. And again, for right now, these are just things you should be thinking about when you read any document. The first historical context. Have you guys heard of context before? Was there something recently in this class that you had to talk about context? How many of you guys wrote the LEQ essay? Then you should have talked about context because that's the, the second thing on the rubric. All right. This is the exact same thing. All right. On your LEQ, which I'm going to be grading those soon. You'll get feedback here hopefully pretty soon. On your LEQ, when you start writing an essay, 
in your introduction, you want to establish context. All context is, and you may want to write this out to the side, it's background information. So when you wrote your introduction, hopefully, because it was all about the classical era, hopefully you gave me some background information on the, the classical era. Uh, maybe you told me who was all around, what sort of things were going on. Uh, and then hopefully you segue of course, to comparing your religions, because that is what the essay was about. Has anybody ever seen Star Wars? Okay. I used to be the biggest Star Wars fan. I love Star Wars. Recent years, I don't know, it just doesn't do it for me anymore. I think the new trilogy, which I still haven't seen the newest one, uh, which I've heard mixed reviews on. Uh, it's just, I don't know, it's different. You know, when I was a kid, I loved that stuff, because, you know, I was born in the 80s. I remember when... Star Wars came out like probably the year I was born, but like I remember Return of the Jedi coming out and uh, I fell in love with it because, you know, I was a kid. And, uh, you know, as I got older, uh, especially I watch it now as a 40 year old, it's like, well, it's OK. But the cool thing about Star Wars and give you guys some background, the first Star Wars movie is actually part four. Which is just weird, right? Uh, and then later in like the 90s and early 2000s, uh, the guy that made him came out with like one through three as the backstory. So George Lucas, the guy that made Star Wars, he's, he's he decides, you know, for some reason, I'm going to start with number four. He's got to get people caught up, right? He's got to let them know how we got to this point. So in the beginning of Star Wars, in almost every single Star Wars movie, even if you haven't seen Star Wars, you may be familiar with it. There's that opening crawl. You know, it's all in yellow and it says once a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And it kind of tells you what's been going on. The Galactic Empire has been causing all sorts of problems and Darth Vader's running around and he's killing people with lightsabers, you know, stuff like that. That way, when you walked into the first Star Wars, you kind of sort of knew what was going on. Have you guys ever seen a TV show where like on Netflix or TV or whatever, where it starts off with like previously on Lucifer or something like that? You guys ever seen that? That's context. That's just in case you missed the last episode. You know more or less what, what happened. You know what's been happening. That way you can still jump into the show and you can kind of sort of enjoy it. Because you're not just going in, you know, uh, with no prior knowledge. That's all context is. All right. So if you look up here, uh, what is the setting of the document? Where is this going on? Uh, what was occurring in the time period and location? If you know about the time period, like say the classical era that we've been talking about, you at least have some frame of reference to go off of. Uh, what has just happened? What's on the verge of happening? Uh, what are the uh, approximate or deep rooted issues causing the document to be created? How does this document represent this era and period? So let's say, you know, we, we came across uh, a diary or a, a newspaper article from the early 1800s, okay? If they were talking about really messed up stuff like slavery or the fact that women didn't really have much in way of rights, at least not equal rights, okay? If you saw that today, you'd be like, oh my God, slavery today? Women not having equal rights? You, it would be preposterous. But the context of the document in the 1800s is that was, even though it was wrong, it was normal. OK, so those are things you need to think about. You need to think about the time period that's coming out of. That way you can kind of appreciate what's being said. All right. So context, easiest way to remember, just background information. That's all it is. And when you're reading a document, you need to think about those things. Think about, you know, who it's coming from and where they are in the time period, because that's going to kind of inform you uh, as to why maybe they're saying some of the things they are. Next one, intended audience. All right, I'm going to give you a hypothetical scenario here, guys. And you guys are sophomores, so, so surely at some point you witnessed a fight here at CTHS. Has everybody seen a fight? Okay, yeah. A lot of fights last year. Hopefully last this year because a lot of people aren't here. So let's say you saw a fight down the cafeteria. And it was, man, it was brutal. There's blood everywhere, tables thrown over, a teacher got punched, all sorts of crazy stuff. You text your best friend who has the next lunch. You tell him what happened. You also text your mom. Tell her what happened. Are those text messages identical? 
Probably not. How, how might the text message to your mom be different than the one to your best friend? You don't got to raise your hand, just say. Might you be a little bit more descriptive with your best friend? Might you perhaps say some words that maybe you would not say to your mom? Yeah, because we talk to, to different people differently. OK, that's what we're talking about audience. All right. If a senator, you know, in ancient Rome is is writing a decree that everybody's going to see, it's probably going to be a little bit different how he phrases things, the opinions he shares than if he's writing a letter to his his mistress or something like that, or a soldier that he knows, one of his friends. That's what we mean by audience. You've got to look at these documents and say, well, well, who is this intended for? Because then sometimes you can understand why it says, what it says, how it says it. Next one's purpose. What's the point? What are they trying to do here? Uh, are they trying to convince you of something? Are they trying to sell you something? Uh, are they just trying to inform you about an event? Are they are they trying to, you know, uh, explain a battle but make themselves look very uh, heroic? Um, one of the classical groups that we talked about was the ancient Greeks. All right? Has anybody ever seen the movie 300? It's, pretty good movie. it's a little old now. The special effects aren't as good as they were, uh, but that's based on a true story. OK, 300 Spartans and several other thousand Greeks they kind of left out of the movie, uh, face down against against the Persians, you know, the largest empire they'd ever been. And there's this, this massive battle, and, and the Greeks ultimately lose, but it slows down the Persian advance enough to where we eventually, I say we, the Greeks eventually win, because the Greeks were kind of the good guy in the movie. And most of the history we have says they were the good guy. But that was from the perspective of a, a Greek historian, all right? And he was writing that for his people. He wanted to make them look like heroes. OK, if it was a Persian historian or maybe an unbiased outside historian, it probably would have looked a lot different. So again, the purpose of why you write something that can kind of get the wheels turning. And finally, point of view, who is this person? Each and every one of us sees the world differently. I'm old. I'm 40 years old. I'm an old man now. You guys are like 15, 16 years old. You've had different life experiences. You've got different backgrounds that have shaped how you see the world. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's one of the cool things about just being alive, you know, getting exposed to outside perspectives. But everything about who we are, uh, our religious beliefs, our ethnicity, our race, our culture, our socioeconomic status, our age, all those things have an influence on how we see the world. It's kind of like that game of telephone. You know, did you ever play that when you were a little kid where uh, you start like a message right here and it goes around the class and by the time it gets to the end, it's, it's a little different, right? Because we interpret what we see differently. And again, when historians are looking at documents, when you're looking at documents, because again, you're kind of like you know, amateur historians now, that's something to think about. Is this person writing this document a king? Are they a peasant? Are they a priest? Are they a soldier? Are they a slave? Are they a man? Are they a woman? Are they rich? Are they poor? Again, those are things that, that kind of impact how we see the world. Now, for right now, this is just an introduction. Later on, when we really have a fairly significant document analysis assignments, or especially when you've got to write about documents in your DBQ essay, these are things that you're going to have to bring up. But for right now, we're just introducing it. That way you can maybe think about these things when we move on to our next thing, which we are right now, our practice document analysis assignment. So let's go ahead and open up our notebooks, or not our notebooks, although you're going to need that too. Open up your computer. Uh, this is on there just in case you didn't get, the, uh, get all the notes. You do need cap explained, the stuff on the side, not necessarily, but you at least need to remember what the acronym stands for. You need to have that in your notebook. The other thing you need to have is answers to these questions. So if you want right under where you put cap, why don't you start number in your paper one to eight? Okay, it's not a whole lot. And rather than just stress about this, guys, this is practice. 
I'm not really looking for complete sentences, although I do want your answers to be relatively thorough. And I want you to be willing to discuss your answers intelligently. Guys, we are going to look at three documents. I believe all of which will show up on the test on Monday. And kind of how the test is, you'll have a document like this one from Ashoka, the Mauryan Emperor, and maybe you'll have three or four questions that are connected to it. Here's the thing on the test, it's not just reading comprehension. It's not like you can read the document and the answer's there somewhere. Sometimes it is, but usually you look at the document, you read it, you think about what it means, you look at where it comes from, who it comes from, then you also think about your prior knowledge, then you can figure out the answer. It's a process. It takes practice. Some of you guys, it's going to come natural and you're going to do great on this test. Others, you're going to bomb it. It's all right. It's just a weird setup and you will get used to it. Uh, and one of the ways you get used to it is looking at documents and thinking about it. So we've got three documents. Uh, the first is an excerpt from the Code of Hammurabi, 1754 BCE. Uh, this is something at some point, uh, I think during my River Valley Civilizations uh, lecture that you should have came across to some extent. The next one is from some edicts of the Moiran Emperor Ashoka. Uh, you had some reading over the Moiran Empire. You should have taken some notes. Uh, Ashoka was mentioned quite a bit. The third and final one is a... It's a pretty short one. It's from Zunzi. He's a Chinese philosopher, uh, circa 250 BC. He's not necessarily the founder of any one philosophy, but he definitely advocates one more than most. So what I want you to do, and I'm only going to give you 10 minutes to do this, because again, remember, most of what we do is time. Our tests are time. So when you read documents, you got to read them one time thoroughly. Read the question one time, thoroughly, answer, move on. And then at the end, if you have time, you can go back and revise. But I'm going to give you 10 minutes to read these documents. Answer the question to the best of your ability. Doesn't have to be complete sentences necessarily, but, you know, you want enough to kind of use to fuel a conversation later on and get through as much as you can. Now, let me go over these, these questions real quick before I just cut you loose. Number one, explain the historical text of this document. I want you to think back. I want you to think back to when you maybe hopefully took notes over Code of Hammurabi. I don't want you to necessarily have to look it up in your notebook, but think about the time period that that came out of, the River Valley civilizations. Think about maybe the, the specific civilization it came out of. Think about anything that you can put down for background information. Number two, what are some characteristics of this early Code of Law? So based on what you're seeing, what's this law code like? What are some observations you're making? And number three, in your opinion, is this system of laws fair? Next, you got some Emperor Ashoka stuff. In your opinion, who is the intended audience? You don't know, but who do you think it's for? Uh, from whose point of view is the document and how might that affect what is being said? It tells you at the bottom who's writing this. You're going to draw some conclusions on how who this guy is, the Moiran Emperor, how that may kind of shape how he sees things, how he says things. Uh, and then number six, based on the passage above, what religion does Ashoka adhere to? What are his opinions of other religions? There is some terminology in here that if you did your religions chart, you might recognize that will lead you to kind of know what religion Ashoka is all about. Plus, I mean, it's one of the key things that you were asked to know about Ashoka, what religion he was into, what he helped spread. Um, and then the rest, you can just look at evidence. And then the final one, based on the, uh, the description, and again, this is your opinion. And a lot of document analysis, especially when we do this like in a DBQ, is your opinion. As long as you back it up with some logic, you're fine. Uh, number seven, in your opinion, what is the intended purpose of this document? So why was it written? And number eight, based on your knowledge of world history, what prominent belief system is the author advocating? How do you know? You got 10 minutes. You're going to answer these in your notebook. OK. Go ahead and have at it. If you don't fully understand the documents, it's OK. Tell me what you think, because I think through our discussion the last 15 minutes, this is all going to make a lot more sense. So go ahead and get started. We'll check back in, in about 10 minutes.
pretty weird stuff in this church. It's just in my mind. It's about the weirdest thing. Context is it. Give you guys about six more minutes. And don't wig out if you don't completely finish. I mean, I want you to try, but it's okay. Let's just practice one day. You have to answer the, the one you didn't get done later on. It's all very important for you to check it out. Three more minutes. And we've got a good solid 15 minutes at the end to just talk about it.
Yeah, it's fine. But you're, if you're like, I, I don't know, it's okay. We'll try to talk about it. Good thing is, though, if you even have an opinion, if you think this is a right or wrong thing, this is just getting me thinking about options. We're going to go over possible right answers. Some of them do have a right answer. Other ones, it is truly your opinion. But that's a beautiful thing, especially when we do our writing. Uh, when you do your DBQ essays, one of the point categories is just showing that you really thought about these issues related to CAP. And how I interpret something and how you interpret something may be different. But if you've got a good argument, you still get the points. So this is just introducing this right now. You don't have to worry about CAP so much on the test, but almost everything else we do with documents. Give me about another minute. Only a handful of y'all, so yeah, we're gonna need some discussion. For not to have to call you out, I will. Put your pencil down. You can kind of fill it out as we go if you want. That's fine. Uh, I encourage you to take some notes as we're talking about this. Because uh, not only will I think it kind of explain how you could look at uh, these issues related to CAP, but also all three of these documents will show up on your test. You've got questions related to these. And who knows? I may just accidentally give away some stuff that's probably going to be answers. Just keep that in mind. Again, on the test, you're not going to be asked about CAP but you are going to have to draw some conclusions. So what we have here is an excerpt from the Code of Hammurabi. Uh, we're going back close to 4,000 years. Uh, the Code of Hammurabi is probably the earliest code of written law, okay? Uh, once you've got writing and you've got these early civilizations, I mean, you got to have law and order. So can somebody tell me what you got for context? And this one I know is kind of hard, uh, but, but does somebody want to share maybe what they put on background information? I kind of gave away some of it. Does anybody know what specific civilization this came out of or what group of civilizations? Right here. Mesopotamia, very good. Uh, Mesopotamia, wow, they're supposed to right up there. Lots of cool stuff came out of Mesopotamia, like the wheel, you know, and, and glass making and uh, probably the earliest irrigation systems. I mean, that is the cradle of civilization. Mesopotamia itself, not a civilization. It's a group of civilizations that were all in the same region near the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, one of those places was Babylon, the Babylonians. Uh, and one of their kings, Hammurabi, he's the guy that really kind of... Uh, uh, put this code of law really out there. So based on what you're seeing, okay, let's move on to number two. What are some characteristics? What are some things that you noticed about this? Anything? All right. I need some participation. I'm going to start calling people. Give me one thing. Uh, monthly rules, though. If you, if you do this one kind of perfect point, actually, you still pay a price. You pay a price. It's retribution. Have you guys ever heard eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth? Okay, a lot of times we see that, oh, that comes out of the Old Testament of the Bible, and it does. But the Old Testament of the Bible was written in this region, so this actually predates that. Uh, this, is, this is something that, that you know, the, the Old Testament would have borrowed a lot from, because, again, that's the historical context. You know, you got to think about the time when especially the Old Testament happenings were going on. Um, so it's very heavily based on retribution. I think that that's something that would be worth writing down, eye for an eye, okay? Because uh, literally, and I don't know, I don't remember if it's in here, uh, might be, uh, very similar things are. But, you know, one of the codes is, you know, you walk up to some guy who's, you know, of the same level than you, 
and you punch him in the eye and you knock his eye out, somebody's going to come and rip your eye out. I mean, it is very much based on reciprocity, on retribution. What else did you guys notice? And I kind of gave away something just a second ago. Let's try to get somebody else. I said if you went up and punched somebody in the eye of the same level as you, what does that imply? Everybody look at, uh, okay, look at uh, number 203, provision 203. If a freeborn man strike the body of another freeborn man of equal rank, he shall pay one gold meaning. So he's paying a fine. So what does that mean? Equal rank. Something that, that really all the earliest civilizations had. What do you think it is? Status. Say it again. Status. We call that social hierarchy. Guys, a lot of earlier legal codes, they reinforce social hierarchy, social classes. Guys, today, they're still social classes, you know, but they're much more informal. The further back you go, guys, you're born into a social class based on who your parents are and what they did for a living and, and how much wealth they had. And you typically stayed in that social class your entire life. There was very little social mobility. So if you were a priest, you were of a much higher rank than, say, a farmer. Uh, if, if you were at the lowest of ranks, I mean, you were a slave. Slavery is one of those evil institutions that's existed for a very, very long time. It goes back as old as, as civilization itself. Pure evil, nothing good about it, but it's something we will see time and time again. So just by looking at this, you know, freeborn, okay, so there were slaves in Mesopotamia, but you also know the laws themselves, they treated people differently. They didn't treat everybody the exact same. If I went up and, and punched somebody of equal rank in the eye, they'd take my eye out, but if I went up and, and there was somebody that was lower in the social hierarchy and I just beat the crap out of them and knocked their eye out, I'm probably just paying a fine. What's something else? How, how does this uh, legal system treat women? Look at it. Because women are, are mentioned a few times. They're stuck at their house. Stuck at their house. Almost seen as property. Definitely not seen as equals. What do we call that? This is one of the first vocab terms we introduced that you're supposed to have in your notebook. What's that called when you have like a male dominated system, a male dominated society? Some of you guys are taking the easy way out now. I'm going to let, is it Kenzie? I'm going to let Kenzie answer this one, but I'm going to start picking people for the rest of them. Kenzie, what is it? It's patriarchy. So even, you know, looking at patriarchy, that sort of male domination, another kind of great evil that we see continuing throughout history, unfortunately, goes all the way back to some of the very first civilizations. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. Now, this last one's just your opinion. And, and, you know, there's not much we can say about it, but do you guys think that's fair? Raise your hand if you think this legal system is fair. It's messed up, but it's the first of its kind. And you're living in, I mean, this is, this is all, you know, the idea of government itself is relatively new at this point. So, you know, laws, they've evolved over time, but, you know, you look at retribution, you look at, uh, you know, things even like the death penalty, it kind of shows you some of the basic themes that we had all the way back then. They carry in the future legal systems. All right, next set of questions. Uh, this one is from the Rock Edicts of the Moyan Emperor Ashoka. Uh, these Rock Edicts essentially, and this is part of your reading, but Ashoka, he would have these, these edicts, these mandates, these rules carved into pillars. And these pillars would be like along roads. They'd be in towns all around the empire. So, so he's got, you know, some of his, his judgments really placed all around for people to see. So with that in mind, and I just kind of gave this away, but in your opinion, who is the intended audience? Let's go, Elijah. Who do you think this is for? Yeah, 
it could be other religions, it could be his own religion, but it's the people. They're publicly displayed. Now, if he was writing a letter to his brother, he probably would phrase he's a little bit different, but he's trying to he's trying to make this consumable for the masses. All right. So maybe there's some opinions he's not sharing. Maybe there's there's some agendas. Again, we can only just imagine. But those are the sort of things you should be thinking when you look at documents. Um, this next one, I mean, I'll kind of handle this because we are starting to run out of time. But from whose point of view is this document and how might that affect what's being said? Who's this document coming from? Just tell me. Ashoka. And, and what sort of person is he? He's an emperor. You think he sees the world the same way as the guy in town selling fruit? No. So you have to interpret those things, okay? His point of view is going to impact what he says. This one, I'm giving away something big, so you might want to write it down. Based on the passage above, what religion does Ashoka adhere to? Uh, and what are his opinions of other religions? I'm going to call on, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, Angel of the religions. And it's one of the religions from the, or from the, the uh, chart that we did. And I'll tell you, the Moran Empire was in India. So this is a hint. What religion do you think he adheres to? Give me a guess. It's not a bad guess at all because Ashoka probably was born a Hindu, but he later converted to another religion that grew out of Hinduism. And it's really because of Ashoka, probably more than any one individual, other than maybe the founder of the religion, that this thing got so widespread because he sent out the missionaries. He paid for a lot of the temples. So what religion do you think he is? He's a Buddhist. OK, uh, and you can tell that uh, in, and again, just real basic terminology, Dharma. Dharma are essentially the, the teachings, the virtues of Buddhism. Now, I know that's small. And, and again, it was something that you should have gotten just from the reading. But that's what I'm saying. One of the reasons we introduced the religions was that key vocabulary, you know, their basic beliefs, behaviors, you know, reincarnation, moksha, you know, the the five pillars of Islam, you know, you, you listen, when you see some of that stuff embedded in these documents, sometimes something that basic can lead you to what the answer is. Um, and opinions of other religions. I mean, he's, he's, you know, he's a Buddhist, he's got an agenda, but he's also kind of pretty open minded. Last one. Okay. This comes from China, 250 BCE. Um, the purpose debatable. Let's skip that one. But based on your knowledge of world history, what prominent belief system is the author advocating? So there was only one belief system that we have talked about thus far that that is indigenous to China. Buddhism gets really big there in part because Ashoka sent all the missionaries and the traders along the Silk Road. But but what was the one that we talked about that was indigenous to China? I mentioned it yesterday. I said that it really kind of lays the foundation for a lot of what China becomes. What do you think it is? Give me a guess. It's one of the ones you could have written about on your essay. If you ever went to a Chinese restaurant and gotten a fortune cookie, you may have seen a quote from this guy. Anybody know? Confucianism. Confucianism. And again, if you know the basic tenets, you know, respect for your elders, uh, a lot of observation of rituals, you know, veneration of your ancestors, uh, plus just the time period and kind of knowing what was popular in that area at that time. Confucius. Who knows if you remember this, uh, this box, there may be something that has to do with Confucianism. If you know it's Confucianism, probably get it right. Go ahead and shut everything down, kind of back up a little bit. I got to spray down the desks. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to watch a little video that, that kind of reviews all the history that we've discussed thus far. It's not super long, but we're going to watch it. We're going to discuss it. Uh, you may have something to add to your notebook just to summarize some of the key points. Uh, then whatever time's left, I'll spend kind of giving you some hints. Uh, some things that you probably want to look up on. 
Guys, I'm not going to give you an official like test review, but all of these things are supposed to be in your notebook. That's your test review. Uh, we put those in there for a reason. I say we. I had to put those in there for a reason. And then on Monday, we'll have the test. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Hopefully everything works the way it should. And the documents are just weird. It takes a little bit. It'll be all good. Uh, probably at some point next week, I'll send you guys, it'll be online, but you'll have an assignment for homework where you'll just be reading through a few documents and answering questions similar to these. And some of you just have to practice, guys. Do a good job. Make sure you've got some semblance of answers going in your notebook by the end of next week. We'll be taking a look.